Thank you, Alexandre. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for the university for welcoming me here. Uh, I see two deans here. Thank you for being here. Uh, whenever I come back with my wife, whenever I'm welcome in Alexandre and Kate's house, and whenever, whenever we come back and see old faces, Eddie, John, other people here that I've worked with a long time ago, it's always a very warm feeling. It's always a great, great, great pleasure for us to come back to Louisiana. It feels like this is home. Uh, my wife calls Louisiana, Ma Louisiana, it says we feel it's a bit of, it's a bit of, it's largely like home for us. So, thank you for this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk, you have a, this time I'm going to read my text, it's a bit more complicated than the last time, I don't want to make any mistakes, so I'm going to start reading it a bit, and then I'm going to stop and show you an excerpt of the film uh, that I think will, will also give sort of the direction of where I want to go. For those uh, two or three students who were at the workshop on the um, Wednesday, Tuesday. Apologize, it's the same film. It's not very long. It's five minutes, um, but I think it gives an interesting uh, movement. But before I start, <clears throat> let's read a quote. The trillions of cell, the trillion of cells, only ten percent of which remember or use anyway, will become parts of trillion of things. And even the ten percent wasn't really yours to begin with. We were only <coughs> borrowed. We've had it backward all along. The body is immortal. It is the soul that dies. So, we're on the cusp of something very dramatic. Great new technologies are fundamentally questioning and altering the foundations of our world. The definition of what is a man and what is a woman, the definition of what is an individual, the definition of what is a living being, in short, the definition of life is now plural and volatile. There we go. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. What does it mean to be human in the 21st century? What does it mean to be human as we draw closer and closer to what Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity? This moment in time when technological gravitation becomes so strong that it pulls the laws of physics, the taxonomy of life, the reality of consciousness, and the essence of humanity into it. This presentation will probe these questions and suggest new ways of looking at them. And while it would be foolish for me to, pro to believe that definite answers could be found here, my goal is to crack the path that may lead to, re to a renewed series of queries and thought processes from which to ponder these critical problems. Evolutionary theory is clear. The living body has one goal, this dissemination of its genes. The body is scarred by evolution and is the result of it. But even today, this very, very basic underpinning is now being challenged by the expansion of our notion, not of reality, which we always knew to be subjective, but of the layers of reality. New layers of reality provided and created by technology show that we are not discrete units. We do not exclusively belong to a species and we are not well delineated individuals. The very idea of humanity, this collective of men and women, each slightly different and each slightly unique, each thought to be conscious and capable of self-awareness, does not appear to clearly address what homo, homo sapiens truly is. What are we? Why are we? What is we? How do we understand and conceptualize the world and the very notion of our awareness when technology constantly challenges it. Is there any truth, reality, and exist, ex, existence outside of our thoughts and bodies, beyond our codes? We have asked these questions for a long time, probably as soon as signs and symbols have been materialized from our hands and minds. But these same questions are now being asked and probed with a renewed urgency by the technological ecosystem. Humanity, we all agree, is the product of large natural phenomena such as evolution, the microcosm, geology, chemistry, physics, etc. My argument here is slightly different. If being and consciousness are the products of complex forces, then one must also consider, and that will be the argument throughout this text, the possibility, possibility that machines, technology, data, and non-sentient natural phenomena such as parasites, viruses, and bacteria may be also central to what humanity is and to what humanities must examine. 
Humans are, humans are machines, many philosophers have claimed, but machines are also human, I will argue. The 21st century is an era of ge geographical, ontological, and epistemological unstableness. This is what William Gibson calls the contemporary absolute. Let me show you now, just give you a bit of, for those who don't know William Gibson, a very famous science fiction writer of the 80s and 90s, one of the founding fathers of what used to be called cyberpunk. He's the one who created the word internet. He's the one who created the sort of a uh, visual culture that became, that gave birth to the matrix. He's, but he's also a very interesting uh, thinker and a uh, person who think about the contemporary. And let me just show you an excerpt of what he means by the contemporary absolutely. Yeah, this diary entry caught him at tackling the, 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 uh, the cut. 
cusp of the change. We, we don't, you know, we don't find it, we don't find it extraordinary that, that we can hear the voices of the dead whenever we wish to. The non-mediated world has become a lost country. And I think that in some very real ways, a country that we cannot find a way back to. The mediated world is now the world. We are that which perceives a mediated reality. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's possible to know what we've lost. We just have, I think there is a pervasive, there is a pervasive sense of loss and a, a pervasive excitement at what we seem to be gaining. And they see those, those two feelings seem to go together. In fact, to me, parts of the same feeling. It's like Peter Jameson's postmodern divine. You have it right there. A sense of loss and a sense of Christmas morning at the same time. I think that most people, myself included, are most comfortable conceptually living about 10 years back from whatever time we've reached. And I think we all have these, these moments uh, that are, are vertiginous and terribly exciting and very frightening in which we, we realize the contemporary absolutely. And, and I think it induces terror and ecstasy and we retreat, we retreat from it because we can't stay we can't stay in, in that state of panic, which is, I think, the real response to what's happening to us. We're, we're more comfortable with an earlier version of who we were, of what we were. It makes us feel more in, more in control. I think Okay, so what is what is the terror and the ecstasy that Gibson talked about? It is the hope and the angst of finding out that our foundations are unsteady, slippery, and volatile. Foundations such as the boundaries we all have in our lives, the boundaries which are in the process of disappearing. Think about geography, of course, we all know about this, but even more dramatically, think about the real and the virtual that are combining every day. Think about the fact that the organic and the non-organic are unifying. Artificial DNA is just one of those examples. And that machines are becoming insect-like, life-like. In fact, <coughs> machines today, we know that, proliferate at a rate similar to those of insects. Think about still with the boundaries. Think about the blurring between intelligent being and non-intelligent things. Think about the current am amalgamation of the species, as we can see with GMOs. Think about intelligent and responsive environments fusing with the natural world. Other foundations that are unsteady, permanence. Think about memory, human as well as machines, overabundant but easily altered or modified. Think about the crisis in mental health and the impermanence of our mental health equilibrium. Think about DNA suddenly becoming very fluid as the new science of epigenetics is telling us. Foundation as you have it here, such as human intelligence and the parameters of human intelligence. Think about phenomena that we always are surrounded with these days, phenomena that directly address what human intelligence is. Autism, ADHD, PTSD. Foundation such as geology, the era, the era we live in now is being called the Anthropocene, which means the geological time when human activities start to have a significant impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems. And finally, foundations such as ontology being modified, altered, and probed by
by machine-based subjective experiences, by the microbiome. Microbiome is the is the uh, is the total sum of all the microbes in your environment. By the volatile definitions of life, we don't really know what life is, and by the by increased life expectancy. This is probably what is meant by the tarot and the ecstasy. As you can see, the sharp, well-defined, distinct, and autonomous <coughs> unit that we perceive to be the individual human, animal, or object, or plant, I'm sorry, seem more like a temporary, permeable, and malleable phenomenon. There are no individuals, there is no single will, there is no consciousness, consciousness capable of pulling away from distinctive physical reactions. There's not even such a thing as one, or not even such a thing as single species. We are, it seems, ephemeral, ephemeral form in a continuum that extends from the microcosm to the macrocosm. How can I make such a claim? Well, if I, if I can quote Lynn Margulis, the human body isn't besieged, saturated, infused with microbial life at every individual. There are no such things as an there's no such thing as an individual, Lynn Margulis would say. What we see as animals are apparently just integrated sets of bacteria. 90% of our genes are not ours, the genes you have in your body. 90% of them are bacterial genes. Close to 10% of your DNA is made of viruses. Parasites have been shown to man manipulate and modify behavior. Even the basic structure of what makes us mammals, the placenta, is now believed to have been created by a virus. We are only layers of microorganism, technology tells us. In fact, according to science, we seem to be doing only what our microbiome tells us to do in all fields of human endeavors. Free will, love, the arts, our longing for the sublime, the thirst for knowledge, the need for community and language, any and all of these activities, which we once believed to be clear evidence of, of, our, of humanity, are only, it seems, different pressures and forces imposed on us and carved in us by both evolution and the microbiome. That's what science and technology are telling us. The world we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste is sensory input data being filtered and structured by the brain. Itself a complex system of electrical and chemical elements. No different from a bacterial network, a social insect system, or the internet. Could our humanity, our memories, our personality, our ability to express love and act with generosity or cruelty be nothing then? with mechanical, chemical, and physical interactions between our microorganism and the environment? Are we nothing but fleeting and unconscious swarm system? We assume that the, that the expression of our, of our world, the goal of our world, the direction of our world, if one can use such terms, is the development and expansion of organically based life form. But I would argue those life forms are a means, not an end. We don't know what the end is, if there is even such a thing. But what we understand of the laws of physics and the principle of chemistry strongly suggests that life is the expression of more fundamental laws. That of the complexification and multiplication of information and that of pushing against entropy, laws that have nothing to do with the preservation of organic life forms. In fact, many would contend that machines, computer, and the internet are themselves nothing but different embodiment themselves of these same laws. What does it mean then to be human in the 21st century? A bit of a dystopian image here, I realize. Um, it probably means that humanity can only be understood through its intertwining with technology and the microbiome. It also means that individual men and women our temporary expression of information and complexity, short-lived vortexes of technology and microbiological worldview. It conceivably means, in our case, and for the sake of my argument, that one cannot talk of humanities in the 21st century using conventional notion of individuality, free will, and con consciousness. That one must also consider phenomenology as the product of machines, parasites, bacteria, and viruses that one probably cannot argue for humanities without arguing for the disappearance of humanity as we know it, and that to be human is to live with and through AI, bacteria, software, computer viruses, machine language, swarm system, and the internet. The question for us then is the following. 
If a 21st century human being is a fleeting form made of machines, the microbiome, evolutionary needs and courses, social construct and large intelligence swarm system that act on the world without consciousness on the basis of simple laws, what does it mean then to explore ethics, aesthetics, the spiritual nature of humanity, humanity itself? What does it mean in terms of education and the way we build our education system? What does it mean in terms of social justice? If we are only systems, if our consciousness is essentially a narrative that acts after the fact, what then is the pursuit of knowledge? What then is the narrative of humanity, the storyline of the humanity? This is our biggest challenge. While quantum physics, evolutionary biology, genomics, neuroscience, and epigenetics continue to reframe, deconstruct, and shatter our limited, linear, delineated, and causal understanding of the world, as they continue to unhinge our notion of the self, of gender, of species, and of free will, the humanity will have to suggest a new narrative, one that makes sense of this unnatural world, one that will also create meaning. A new chronicle of humanity is now needed, one that expands the limit of the technological event horizon, one that features extreme notions of the world, one that includes radical concept of what life is and what the human species is not. A new chronicle of humanity is now needed, one that will combine this notion with our need to act as if we had free will, to long as if love was more than chemical reactions to evolutionary clues, to believe we can actually create a better and kinder civilization. This will not be easy or quick, but I believe it is fundamental. My argument is that the most crucial mistake we could make would be to hang on to our old notions of humanity and the humanities, to argue against these new perceptions, to deny the almost total control of the microbiome on our behavior, to claim an exclusiveness to humanity, to use the world of art, poetry, music, and aesthetics, all unfortunately perfectly explainable as evolutionary systems, to use all of this to defend an already broken through an invaded fortress, that to me is our biggest potential mistake. The human species, it appears, must now be extended to the microcosm, to the microbiome, to technology, and to phenomena that we can consider neither conscious nor alive. Ethics, justice, empathy, and the drive to understand must now, must now probably include and, to, and take into account the world of viruses, AI, and computers. It may seem very hard to accept, but if one agrees that these phenomena have a direct and powerful impact and influence on humanity, if one argues further that their roots allow for the tree of humankind to exist, then one must also agree that to treat them as outside forces that have nothing to do with humanity is a dangerous game to play. What does it mean? Well, it mean, it may mean, there's a may here, it may mean dramatically and counterintuitively developing notions of justice and respect for assumed to be ubiquitous robots. It may mean understanding and treating the internet as you would any other natural system. It may mean accepting that the microbiome is a living ecosystem as important and, and as deserving of respect as the Amazon forest. We are human, I would argue, because we now experience a completely mediated reality, as Gibson has said, because our bacterial flora is part and parcel of our thoughts, because the intrusion of viruses in our DNA dictates how we behave, because evolution creates the push and the need for love, aesthetics, and beauty. This, this was actually done by computer. Soon machine, without any human intervention. Soon machines will make ethical decisions for us as the Google car is making clear. Soon machine will have the ability to learn, reflect, pause, and create moving artworks. Soon machine will be an active, active participant in our ethical discussions and dilemma. Technology is expanding our notion of the countless and intertwined layers of reality and meaning. Through technology, we now have access to quantum physics, which suggests, which suggests, for example, the impossible, in, impossible entanglement of atoms. Through technology, the unseen physical material of the universe, what we currently call dark matter, will soon open up new understandings of the world. Already, machines are generating data that gives us access to extraordinary patterns, which are completely unaccess unaccessible to an unaided human mind. 
Humanities in the 21st century could be humanities of men, women, machines, parasite, evolution, dark matter. Humanities in the 21st century could be humanities that understand that if man and woman are but a small but critical piece of a larger puzzle, perfectly integrated into that puzzle, then what we all need, hope for, and desire, justice, ethics, respect, meaning, are also the result of mechanisms deprived of what we consider to be free will, and may, and may thus be common to all phenomena. Perhaps humanities in the 21st century should give credence to the notion that our very basic notion of consciousness, intent, and agency can only be the result of large unconscious systems, that our ability to self-reflect, to contemplate, and to be moved by aesthetics are the result of the countless living organisms deep within our fabric, the same living organisms, the same evolutionary forces that permeate all dimensions of reality, all layers of life, all expressions of nature, technology, and the natural world. Our experiences are probably not specific to our species, but universal. Expressed and mediated differently, yes, but common to all living organisms. Humanities then, instead of being unique to human, could actually be the universal matrix needed to understand the ecosystem, the framework applied to all expression of nature and evolution. Pleasure, as David Parrish said, and you have it here, is not something that nature doles out without a reason. And we would expect this reason to be intimately linked to maximizing fitness. If this is the case that you have up there, then the pleasure of thinking, reflecting, questioning, the pleasure of being moved, touched, and saddened, the pleasure of creating and modifying, the pleasure of building a just society, one that constantly expands the circle of empathy, all these pleasures may not be unique to humans. In fact, the desire for justice, the need for ethics, the longing for compassion may be universal traits that all living organisms and all systems share. The humanities of the future could, it could include every organism, every system, organic and non-organic, and every technology. Imagine what such, for those who remember the movie, imagine what such humanities would look like. Imagine how exciting building such humanities will be. Imagine how complex and complicated that task will be. But also imagine how fruitful, how encompassing and how pleasurable it may be to achieve what we have longed for for thousands of years, folding the human back into the world. Thank you.